Hi everyone, welcome to the final installment of the New Economy series. We here at ThriveDX have greatly enjoyed partnering with Upsia to offer the series and hope that each installment has been useful to you and your institution. One of the reasons we have done this series is to help further the knowledge of the huge opportunity cybersecurity offers to the world, our institutions, and every individual who uses the internet in any way, which would be every institution that's represented here. We want to be part of a continuing to promote cybersecurity for the security and benefit of our nation and people through providing competent cybersecurity professionals to fill the over 600,000 cybersecurity jobs that are currently open in America today. This not only allows for greater protection for institutional and personal data and against fraud, but also provides pathways to phenomenal careers for individuals who are seeking to move into a cybersecurity role where jobs are plentiful, wages are healthy, and future opportunity for, for professional growth and promotion is high. By training these individuals through our industry-based and workforce-proven skills-based cybersecurity curriculum, labs, and assessments, and assisting them in finding their role within the field within six months or less after graduation, we proudly reach, we proudly reach our mission of preserving and advancing security while also supporting individuals and in changing their lives and achieving their dreams. If you're interested in hearing more, more or partnering with us, please do reach out after this webinar and we will be glad to visit. Again, we want to thank UPSIA for their partnership. Thank you for attending these webinars. We look forward to we look forward to what you will hear and hope to speak with you about how your institution can be a part of a high quality education that leads to life change for learners through the cybersecurity field. And now on to you, Jim. Thank you very much, Ashley, and uh, welcome everybody uh, in terms of our third in final series uh, on the new economy uh, with ThriveDX and Lightcast. <clears throat> Thank you for ThriveDX for sponsoring this. Um, my name is Jim Fong. I'm the Chief Research Officer at Upsia. And uh, I've been with Upsia now for almost 13 years. And Upsia is a nonprofit located in Washington, DC. And we serve about, about 400 institutions and organizations uh, in terms of the professional continuing online education uh, kind of environment there and uh, you know our goal here with this series is really to to help our our members to kind of look a step ahead uh, and, and we're going to actually be doing a fourth one uh, with a different partner here and I think we're going to focus in on the cannabis industry so and on all the jobs that that creates uh, along the way so with that being said I just kind of want to kind of flow into into what we're going to be doing today and so on our our next uh, slide there we're going to be talking about the IoT landscape, uh, labor market analytics, and our, our friends at, uh, uh, at Lightcast will be talking about that. Then we're going to talk about IoT and cybersecurity here. And I'm, each, each of our panelists there, each of our contributors will introduce themselves because I can't do, do it justice in terms of what they're doing uh, for the field and for industry. Uh, and then we're going to talk about IoT and education, kind of tie it all together. So one of the things I wanted to to kind of encourage us to, to do is to think about okay, let's get out of what we what we're doing today and let's start looking at the future and what what IoT is. But in order to understand IoT, we really need to kind of get at what is the landscape. And so I just want kind of want to reflect real briefly about what IoT is. So Bruce, next slide, please. So to me, IoT is really about anything that's connected to the internet. How do we actually uh, make things be better or different? You know, we can all reflect back in terms of what the automobile was and you know, it really wasn't connected to anything except for maybe the radio and listening to radio waves here. I'm going to date myself back, you know, uh, a number of years here, but now auto even automobiles are connected to the internet. So it's really, you know, now we're, we're wireless, but you know, it's really about a wired connectivity, but now we're, we've kind of moved on to wireless technologies in addition to that. But IoT is everything that connects onto something. It's connecting people. So without, without IoT, we really don't have social media. We really cannot connect onto people that are halfway across the world here. So IoT means a lot of things. It isn't, it isn't just our Alexa systems or Google Nest or whatever. In fact, I made sure I unplugged mine because when I said that, I didn't want it to kind of go off and respond back to me. But it's our ring systems, that's our security systems. I managed my little ring network around my house and my office. Uh, my wife made me get rid of my ring camera that was in my kitchen and whatever. And she said it was too creepy. And then I, and you know, she's, there's also a little bit of worry about somebody hacking into it or whatsoever. I also manage a 
you know, a family member's ring system in their summer house. I can see everything that's going on there. That's another thing that's happening. There's also uh, other technologies that are also connected onto it. Obviously, our automobiles. Now, we need to have Internet of Things connecti uh, connectivity on, on self-driving vehicles, especially with all, the, with all the AI that's going on. And I know the big buzzword has been chat GPT, but that's just an example of AI happening. But all of this is information that's being sent back and forth so we can operate better. So cars obviously need to be safe. Otherwise, we've seen the sci-fi movies that bad things happen. We've also seen what's happening, what's going on with Ukraine and Russia right now regarding drones. And those are all those are all connected. That's all Internet of Things. Internet of Things also means, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, and Bruce will talk about it, but also industrial Internet of Things as well. Um, you know, the company called, you know, obviously Honeywell, they actually monitor, they have equipment that monitors their employees when they're up on a scaffold, scaffolding, you know, working on a building or whatever. They monitor, make sure people are healthy and safe and whatever. All these health statistics are being sent back. That's Internet of Things as well. And so, Bruce, we can kind of wrap up this one slide. There's other things here. How much, you know, we actually, which I think is kind of silly, but it's there, but you can look inside your refrigerator. You can put a camera in there. You can actually have it measure things. You can have it measure the weight of things, how much milk is left. It's it's, it's a little bit too far for me. Activity trackers, that has changed a lot of our lives. That's actually making us healthier in a, in a, in a lot of different ways. Uh, I track, you know, I'm a, I'm a statistician by training and, you know, a trend person, you know, by night here, but my, I have an activity tracker. I have a Garmin and I track all my statistics. And, you know, even our scales where we weigh ourselves are Bluetooth and they, they're connected. All of these things are, are create this world, which is very, very dynamic, but there's a lot of risks involved. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we'll also talk uh, about the evolution of, you know, of jobs that are created. And our, our friends at, at Lightcast will talk about that shortly. Uh, Morgan and Gabby will kind of give you an, uh, an outline about how are they tracking things? So as I hand, before I hand this off to, to Bruce, I want to thank our, our two companies here. And I've always said this in a number of venues here and a number of presentations that both Lightcast and Thrive DX are two of my favorite companies. Not that they, they treat me nice or anything like that, but they, they're, they're filling a, a, a void uh, that's happening in our society and in our industry. For Lightcast, I've always appreciated the fact that they've connected data. They've taken you know, I used to work with Bureau of Labor Statistics data. They've taken their own, they've taken that data, they've put algorithms on it, they've connected labor force data, they've connected higher education data, they've created this whole ecosystem, which actually makes my job better. But as a data person, I appreciate that. And now they can you can dive deeper in terms of different industries. So they'll talk a little bit more about how it relates regarding cybersecurity. Thrive DX, I remember talking to the first iteration of Thrive DX, Hacker U, uh, Thrive DX later on, I think purchased Hacker U, but I remember talking prof to professionals there like saying, and this is like at least six or seven years ago, I said, we need more people like you to help solve our, our future potential problems, such as mine last night where I, where I picked up a virus and whatsoever. But I think our world right now is in need of cybersecurity professionals, especially with the number of devices that we have exposed to the marketplace. So with that being said, I'm going to hand uh, the presentation off to Bruce Etter. Bruce Etter is a senior director of research at UPSI. He's been with UPSI now for about seven or eight years and serves a role where he works with day-to-day -day research as well as working with me in terms of trend research. So Bruce, here you go. Thank you, Jim, and, and for the lovely table setting there. And good afternoon to everyone, or I suppose some of you could still be good morning. So good morning to those of you as well. Um, I'm going to briefly talk a little bit about kind of these overarching concepts, and then we'll get into kind of more nuts and bolts, numbers and percentages with, with our friends at Lightcast and at Thrive as well. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about, I don't have any fancy fun pictures here, but the kind of summation, what is IoT? And that's what we're going to refer to for the Internet of Things. We're going to keep calling it IoT. And as Jim mentioned, it's, it's really the, the physical network of objects that connect and exchange data with other devices over the internet. So it can be everything from your fridge to your car. Um, and it, this is really being implemented in more and more. Uh, we talked a little about automotive industry where sensors can detect equipment when it's near failure, right? Let's say your, your tires are getting low or your oil needs change or those sorts of things. But we can also see it you know, for utility companies um, where we're seeing a small outage here and here and we can deploy resources accordingly to make it a little bit more efficient. So that's really what the Internet of Things is, is it's this 
greater connectivity of all things that can connect to the internet. And I had to learn a little bit about this myself getting ready for this presentation. And I think this graphic is really helpful in terms of, well, how does IoT work? And a typical IoT system works through the real-time collection and exchange of data, right? So first we have this IoT application, and this is a collection of services and software that integrates data received from various IoT devices, right? It uses machine learning or artificial intelligence technology to analyze the data and make informed decisions which are communicated back to the IoT device. That leads us nicely into this second bucket, the smart devices. These are the actual collectors of the data, right? These are the, the cameras, the weight sensors, the wind sensors, all these sorts of things that collect data from the environment, user inputs or usage patterns. And this is communicated over the internet from its, and from it to the IoT application. So, you know, uh, Jim mentioned security cameras as an example. Uh, another one might be, you know, uh, your fridge or your thermostat, right? Those are easy things. I, I know my dryer is connected to the internet. So if I wanna warm up those socks before I get home, I can do that. Uh, the last little bit here is graphical user interface. And, and this is really the part that we see, right? This is the user facing side of things. And it can be managed through a variety of ways. Um, oftentimes, I would say the overwhelming majority of times that we're actually interacting with them, it's going to be through a mobile app or through a website that we can use to register or control these devices. So we also talk a little bit about why is this important? And I think some of this is master of the obvious, right? As things continue to connect people, processes, and things, we're going to improve efficiencies, right? Everyday objects are going to connect to the internet and be talking to one another. Um, these physical objects can then share and collect data with minimal human intervention. So low cost computing, the cloud, big data, all those sorts of things can be leveraged within this. Uh, digital systems can then record, monitor, and adjust in each interaction between these connected things. And this can lead to a variety of analyses, right? So if we know, oh, okay, no one's going to be in this particular room from 1130 at night to seven in the morning, maybe we can have a motion sensor that just turns the lights off, or we can turn the heat down, or all those sorts of things. And it's really, it, it, it's the idea is to increase efficiencies across the board. Another everyday life example might be, you know, if uh, you hit the snooze button on your alarm and automatically your blinds open and your coffee machine starts, right? So that we can kind of kickstart the day once we are done with that snooze. Um, there's also loads of examples when it comes to, to business to help it accelerate innovation. You know, I, I, Jim mentioned Honeywell. There's a number of other companies that are that are working within this space. And that kind of leads into one of the more applied applications of IoT, which is industrial IoT. Uh, and this is that application of the technology in industrial settings, right? So think of the manufacturing plant, if you will, um, where we've got a bunch of instruments that and sensors and controls and devices that are all connected to the internet and all talking to each other. Um, we've used machine to machine communication for a while, but this wireless automation and control you know, layered with the cloud, layered with other technologies is just kind of dramatically increasing the potential uses of I IoT in this case, right? So this can be things, we've, we've highlighted just a handful, but these aren't the only ones, smart manufacturing, smart power grids, smart cities, connected logistics. I, I would throw um, smart universities, smart campuses on there. We're starting to see a few things within that space. I know, uh, for example, Arizona State University has nested a boatload of IoT stuff within their, their new football stadium um, to help kind of control crowd flows, control heating costs, control cooling costs, all these sorts of things. So there's a number of ways that we could potentially apply it to our institutions as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit here on my last slide about kind of the, the future of IoT, and then we're gonna get into the labor market data side of things. Um, but really there's, there's a lot that goes into this and we just picked four, but I think these four kind of help summarize and, and comprise what, what we're really talking about here. And the first one's gonna be IoT and cybersecurity. As more devices are connected via the internet of things, this is gonna increase the attack surface area and avenues that hackers have to exploit. Uh, I was just reading one today about how now our smart TVs are becoming vehicles for, for these sorts of attacks. And so not only on the consumer side, but it's also gonna be critical on the business side, right? If, especially if we're gonna be a business that has thousands upon tens of thousands, if not more devices connected to our systems, the, the risk to cybersecurity, or the risk of cybersecurity threats is, is very dramatic and real. But this isn't going away either. The, the second bucket here is the growth of IoT marketplaces. 
IoT is going to continue to expand, right? We've, we're forecasted to have, get this number, more than 27 billion devices online by 2025, 27 billion, right? And if all of these things are going to be connected and talking, there's going to be exponential growth and applications for this that we're not even yet envisioning, right? Um, so it, it's, it's really just starting to scratch the surface. One of the other things we're going to see is this evolution of IoT and AI. So if we can teach with this tremendous amount of data, right, and we're having these, these more um, progressive, I guess is the word I'll use, uh, machine learning applications where they can take and sift through this amount of data and start to apply it to behavioral patterns, to other sorts of analyses that we can actually start to leverage this information. One example would be uh, you know, using it as traffic management. So some cities are starting to implement various IoT systems uh, combined with AI to kind of improve traffic flows. Um, Jim was talking earlier about wearable technologies. There's lots of applications there in health, fitness, and education. And then the last one here is the rise of the smart industry. Um, this can be a, a lot of different things, but kind of one of the ones I want to focus on is predictive analytics. So using sensors to help companies and institutions and industries be more proactive about maintaining things, right? Be more proactive about oh, if this, this, and this happens, we can predict that this will then happen and prevent it from happening. It can also be applied to, to universities again. Uh, I mentioned that Arizona State example. There's, there's loads of other ones. Even uh, my, my alma mater, Penn State, is doing a couple of things within this space. Uh, but it's a, it's a world of untapped resources, right? But it's one that we need to protect. Um, and so getting to how do we actually educate these individuals and what sort of demand might we see on the labor side, I'm going to pass it over to my friends at Lightcast to talk a little bit more about that piece. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, and I am Gabby Kappas. I'm an account manager here at Lightcast. And myself and my fellow colleague, Morgan Markley, will be talking about the labor market data of things on um, the IoT, mechatronics, cybersecurity, and chat GPT. And some key questions that we at Lightcast um, are seeking to address are, how has the IoT impacted our economy historically? Um, following this trend in automation, what new skills and occupations are now in demand? What are the higher ed programs where students can gain degrees and certifications in these growth occupations? And how are disruptive skills related to IoT changing the labor market and the educational landscape? So it's first important, I think, to highlight the analytical and data lenses that we at Lightcast use. Um, and we surface this data um, and choreograph it using our comprehensive labor market analytics tool, Analyst. Um, we're looking at structured government data, as well as job postings data that showcase trends in industry, occupation, job titles, skills, completions from iPads data, um, all in order to identify and track growth and disruption in the labor market. So considering the IoT and seeking to track its changes historically in the labor market, we can first look at how industries have either grown or decreased over a five-year period. So here looking at a comparison between 2017 and 2022, we can identify a significant growth in job postings um, in these particular industries where the internet of things has been listed as a specialized skill. So some of these growth industries are computer system design services, no surprise there, right? Wireless telecommunication carriers, again, another one, no surprise there. Automobile manufacturing, um, the smart technology in cars, um, Jim was um, talking about too, um, electronic manufacturing, these are all ones that have seen huge, significant growth. Um, the semiconductor industry, 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 in, industry, which is interesting to point out, um, has seen this consistent postings over a five-year span too. When we dive a little deeper here, we can look at the top job titles then and now over this time time frame. Um, so 2017, we were seeing job titles with the IoT in the title, which I thought was so fascinating to kind of see that trend, you know, IoT technology architecture managers, IoT software engineers, um, IoT solutions architects, for example. In 2022, we're still seeing the specialized skill of IoT um, pop up in job postings and be very popular. But what's fascinating is that the job titles themselves don't have that nomenclature anymore. So instead we're seeing product security engineer, you know, data engineer, um, retail mobility sales rep, 
um, all in the top 10 job titles that are showcasing the IoT. Um, so, you know, looking at this historical data, um, we might think then, you know, and, and how IoT has permeated these markets, you might think, you know, what does it become now and where do we see it um, becoming in the future? So taking a look at the IoT from the lens of a career pathway, you know, thinking about IoT as a skill and what other skill clusters are associated with it on job postings. We see the IoT paired with Python, um, agile methodology, AWS, software development and automation um, in the occupation of cybersecurity analysts where we see an 18% growth projection over a 10 year time frame. And likewise, you know, the IoT is paired with AI, Microsoft Azure, um, machine learning and automation with a field of mechatronics engineer where we see a 20% growth and these are light cast projections um, over a 10-year time frame. So to take a deeper look into this, I'm going to pass it to my colleague Morgan who will discuss this more in depth. Thanks so much, Gabby. Um, so we're going to continue on uh, with a focus on cybersecurity and what that looks like in the higher ed market. So some of the top programs that are mapped to cybersecurity as an occupation are IT, computer science, network and systems administration. And between 2017 and 2021, there have been over 200,000 completions or conferrals in these programs. That's a 32% growth over that period of time, uh, really showcasing the demand for these types of programs. Next slide. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, qualifications are a really important piece of the cybersecurity landscape. So these go beyond skills and they require additional training or authorization. So not too shockingly, lots of requirements of security clearance at different levels here um, in the cybersecurity landscape. Um, we also see project uh, management certification as well. So just alone, the qualification of security is in about 340,000 job postings at almost 12 million um, from February 2021 to February 2023. Really, you know, showcasing that demand for um, the security level, which, you know, kind of ties back to what, you know, Jim was kind of talking about, about, you know, all those different, um, you know, security pieces when it comes to IoT. Gabby also touched upon mechatronics. So mechatronics is really a uh, subset of engineering that focuses on the integration of mechanical, electrical, and electronic engineering systems. But it also includes a combination of robotics, computer science, and product engineering. So as we continue to explore automation in IoT in the labor market, we see 32% of job postings in the mechatronics field asking for the specific skill of automation. And then looking at the top industries and job titles um, here in the labor market in regards to mechatronics, we see the top industry being the semiconductor, um, but also a wide array here of um, you know, employment placement agencies, higher ed, engineering as well. So we have the same kind of difference over on the, um, the job titles. So we have robotics tech, but also relocation managers and new product engineers. Uh, similarly, down on the, um, you know, who's hiring, we have ASML, they're a semiconductor manufacturing company, but we also have furniture manufacturers on here and recruiting agencies as well, being the, uh, the top companies posting for uh, mechatronic engineers. So similar to the growth that we saw in cybersecurity and higher ed, we are also seeing completion or conferral growth in the mechatronic sector as well. So um, between 2017 and 2021, we see a 9% growth in programs such as engineering mechanics, nanotechnology, assistive and augmentative technology. So something to keep in mind is that, you know, these, um, these programs are being mapped back to the occupation of mechatronics. So a program might not, you know, be labeled mechatronic engineer, um, but we're taking these, these programs and mapping it to that occupation. So some of the, uh, the top uh, universities um, and institutions here, we have the University of Michigan, Georgia Institute of Technology, um, University of Florida, uh, and Purdue. So in tandem with the growth that we're seeing in the higher ed uh, sector, mechatronics is also seeing growth within the labor market, uh, specifically the amount of job postings. So we have a small sample size here. So we have February, 2021, 
um, then matched back to February 2023, there is a 65% growth of employers looking to hire mechatronic engineers. So really helpful for us to see the change in what live job posters are asking for, um, especially you know when looking to uh, possibly develop a program. All right, we're going to get a little bit here into uh, test automation, uh, which is the practice of running tests automatically, managing test data, and utilizing results to improve software quality. So over a 10-year period of growth, it has more than doubled as a skill. We have it at 145% growth from February um, 2013 to February 2020. Three, um, which is really just an incredible, incredible number there. So um, as we continue to talk about our evolving world in IoT and you know automation and Chat GPT, I'll uh, hand it back over to Gabby uh, for some more details there. Thank you so much, Morgan. Um, yes, as Morgan mentioned, it would probably be remiss um, in our present day and age, um, thinking of AI and automation, not to uh, to discuss the introduction of ChatGPT and its demands in the labor market. You know, these past four months. Um, you know, when we think about this AI chatbot and its abilities to write narratives, code, multiple languages, um, we might even think about its potential to revolutionize the field of natural language processing, you know, by presenting a language model that is capable of generating this human-like text. Um, so we might ask the question, what does, where does this chat GPT disruption take place in the labor market? And so here we see the top job titles. Um, that are asking for chat GPT as a specialized skill. So we're seeing everything from you know, data scientists, software engineers, to marketing, to social media coordinators, um, you know, NLP engineers, and of course, information security analysts. So a wide dispersal um, here. And when we go a bill further here too, we can, um, on the next slide, we can begin to think about higher ed programs that map two occupations with the skill of ChatGPT. And as you can see here, we're seeing everything from computer science, economics, um, math, communications, journalism, marketing, right? Where learners could potentially pursue a field where ChatGPT is an in-demand skill. Um, along then on the right hand side with these other skill clusters here, you know, so we're seeing chat GPT appear on job postings with AI, research, marketing, leadership, um, machine learning. Um, and I think this is really showing um, that um, we're seeing everything from these soft skills to hard to tech skills all being clustered with, with chat GPT um, in the skill side and then also higher ed programs that are really running the gambit from STEM to the humanities. Um, I think it's thereby highlighting like the versatility um, of the skill across many different career pathways um, as we've seen it trace the evolution through automation um, with IoT um, in relation to chat GPT. So now I'll pass it over, I believe, to um, the Thrive team. Great, thank you so much. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of security, cybersecurity, uh, in relation to uh, Internet of Things. So you've heard before, and it's very well, uh, it's been very well said here on this presentation. There are many, many great things about IoT, Internet of Things. It allows us to have greater productivity. It allows for situational awareness more immediately, knowing immediately what's going on somewhere because of the communication abilities of two devices um, that doesn't necessarily have to go through the internet. Uh, one of the things about the internet of things is uh, communication happens between uh, two machines that are able to talk together. That can happen through Bluetooth. It can happen through uh, other areas. So it allows uh, absolutely um, for a greater understanding of what is currently happening, what should happen next uh, in a, a much more pronounced way. Efficiency goes along with that. Monitoring physical and field conditions, what's going on outside, what's going on with our heart, with our health. Our Apple Watch will read what our, our uh, pulse is. It'll tell uh, our phone, if you're in a wreck, your phone will somehow tell Apple that there's been a wreck and Apple will talk to 911 because of all the communication pieces between this. That's something I couldn't have fathomed uh, 10 years ago, much less I could imagine 30 years ago, but it certainly has made life in some ways better and made us more educated about ourselves and about what's going on around us. These are all good things. Um, and there are uh, elements of lower maintenance cost for this as, as uh, these communications become uh, between these uh, um, machines uh, become more prevalent, 
uh, and these machines become more prevalent. Uh, obviously, the costs go down on these things. Um, it's sometimes it's easier to replace than it is to maintain. And so there are all kind of benefits to having IoT and having very strong IoT, which really makes it something that's exciting. Uh, it has been growing. It will continue to grow. And as you've seen with some of the stats, the, uh, the job uh, relations to it and the opportunities for career paths is very, very strong. So it's a very, very good thing. Now, in saying that, when you say that there's a very, very good thing, you always want to say, however, you want to look at the other side. There are many, um, I wouldn't say many downsides, but there are downsides to things like this. Uh, and I wanted to give a couple of examples. Uh, you heard about one, but they're, they're coming along every day. Uh, you can think about cars that because they're communicating with other cars, uh, they're um, autonomous and driving. They're communicating with satellites in the sky and communicating with the Internet, et cetera. Uh, you're seeing reports of cars being able to be hijacked even while they're, they're being driven. They're shut down. Uh, data from individuals whose phones are connected to the cars and then the cars, their signals that they're sending out to other cars or to the, the automaker or to OnStar or whatever it is. Uh, that information is being stolen. That's putting the risk of um, the individual whose information it is uh, in a very precarious place. And so this is not a good thing. Um, with healthcare, uh, absolutely, machines in the hospitals talk to each other. They communicate with each other. What happens when someone comes in and they uh, put some type of malware in there that uh, really uh, steals or hijacks that communication. The machines don't work well. Doctors and nurses cannot see how the patient is doing. Um, these are very, very big concerns. There have been examples um, of uh, actually a huge, huge malware piece. Uh, Bruce, if you go to the next slide, called the Mariah, the Internet of Things botnet. And what happened here was um, there was, a, 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 I guess you could call it a, vi a virus that was written that was sent out to uh, thousands and thousands of devices that were connected, that were communicating together. And uh, one central device turned all of these devices into little bots that all would do what that one device did. Um, so these were consumer devices, these were laptops, these were cell phones, these were all kinds of devices like that. All of these devices were then used to converge on certain systems, certain websites to shut them down and to cause those websites to have to go and seek help. What they found was that two individuals who they finally uncovered had made this, this botnet um, cyber attack were two individuals who also had the antidote for it. They have a company that was meant to um, help resolve DDoS attacks where, all again, all these botnets, uh, all these bots would converge on and would attack uh, these machines. And so they made a malware that would cause huge chaos, and then they would be called to fix the chaos by the companies that it was happening to. And all of that happened because of... Um, weaknesses uh, within the, the internet of things, the communication processes, the code of these individual thousands of, of machines. And so there are issues there. Another one is we think of our children and we think of their data. Uh, VTech, which is, we, if you have children, you probably have uh, something that's VTech. They make electronics for children. Uh, they, a few years back, had a huge, huge data breach because all of the machines that children had been using with a certain messaging piece on it where they can message each other or a learning app that was there that would then collect information on the children so the children, the parents of the children could see how the children were learning, um, which parts of, of VTech software they were actually engaging with. All of this was hacked into. And so these hackers have 6.4 million uh, kids' information that they were then able to use as they wanted to. That was a big deal. And so to keep these types of things from happening, we have to think about the wonders of the Internet of Things, which are great and really make life easy and really will help and have, uh, have helped and will continue to help into the future. 
But also as we're devising these and as we're thinking about Internet of Things and the great things it's going to do, how do we make sure that we're safe from the technology that we make? Um, well, there are a few pieces that us at here at Thrive DX look at, of course, understanding IoT file systems and protections. These are parts of our curriculum that we put in that with all cybersecurity pieces, we understand what file systems are. How do we, uh, how do we know them? How do we run them? Also, how do we protect them? But now with Internet of Things, are there certain places that we need to focus on more regarding security that we wouldn't have thought of maybe 10 or 20 years ago? Well, of course, automobiles and their systems, anything with transportation is a huge piece. And actually, with one of our university partners, one of our, our great uh, university partners, University of Michigan, we have um, built uh, part of a, uh, our cy cybersecurity curriculum uh, based around something like this, where, of course, Michigan is a hub for manufacturing, a hub for automobile manufacturing, working with the University of Michigan and with another uh, uh, entity, we developed something that looked at how do we do cybersecurity in advanced manufacturing, especially for automobiles, to where as automobiles are communicating with each other, as they are communicating with servers uh, about what's going on with the car, how is driving happening, who's driving, all those things. How do we think about the security of all those communications and the security of the automobile and the security of the people before that car ever rolls off the assembly line? How do we think about it in regards to the machines that are communicating to actually build that car within the factory so that when that car rolls off, yes, absolutely, it is technologically advanced and makes life great and easy, but it's also very safe, not just in regards to seat belts and tires and, and, and wheels, but in regards to the, the electronic pieces that are on there and the signals that it's sending out. It's going to be the same for healthcare, looking at developing that specifically for healthcare. How do we um, protect and manage the communications and the information that those machines uh, communicate to each other so that we know how patients are doing or we know how we are doing. Um, these are going to be big, big things that are coming up, have come up, and will come up that will have to uh, continually be thought about and taught within cybersecurity curriculum. Uh, anything infrared is a big piece of how uh, the dangers of internet or, or the internet of things can happen, stealing those infrared signals um, or uh, really making sure that they don't work well. And then there's chaos again. Um, and finally, again, I mentioned healthcare. That's going to be a large focus there. So transportation, healthcare, manufacturing, all these types of pieces, not only individually is Internet of Things working very, very well for us, but it's allowing us to make huge leaps in advanced manufacturing. But as these leaps are happening, there can be more and more gaps in the safety of it. So what our job is to do as uh um, developers of curriculum regarding cybersecurity and especially regarding internet of things and working with industry partners and university partners is, is to really give learners and people who want to go into this field the opportunity to understand the internet of things as a whole, the good that it does, also dangers within it, inherent dangers within it. But what do those dangers look like specifically for the area they are in, where jobs are going to be developing that need to be filled um, regarding certain uh, aspects of that economy. So there's lots to be done. Uh, we look forward to continuing to be a part of it. We're excited about the future of Internet of Things, but also we want to be cautious and we want to continually look at how do we make this the safest thing we can to make it work optimally, but also to make sure that the, the consumer and the institution and all of our data is uh, is protected. So with that, I'll throw it over to Jim. Thank you very much, Whit. And you know, it's so complicated, and it touches all of our all of our lives. If you, I almost think it's like almost like oxygen and water at this point. It's it's the internet. It's it cuts across almost everybody in our society. It cuts across almost every industry, and uh, it you know it's it seems like it's so it's something that we need to to keep our our lives and our economy, we've, we've become so dependent on it. Uh, but how do you actually protect it? 
and you've got to do a lot of things to protect it, just like we, we try to do with with oxygen, with, with water, with whatsoever. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of vulnerabilities. And, and so I really appreciate uh, what the folks at Thrive DX are, are doing there. Uh, one of the things I wanna cite is that the fact is that uh, we, there's still a shortage and there will be a shortage. We cannot get ahead uh, of the hackers and the nefarious folks out there. Uh, one of the, the statistics I came across is that uh, you know, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that the cybersecurity profession uh, employed 4.7 million people globally. And then you think that's that's a big number, and it is a big number. It's the highest that the that the profession has ever has ever employed, but it's still it's still 3.4 million short of what they need. And so, you know, we've only really filled up 60% of the positions. And until we do, until we do get ahead of that, uh, these folks will still come across and try to do bad things. And so this is something where, how does it relate to education and how do we actually engage uh, more individuals in this profession? Because it's, it's a growing need. It, it should be more foundational. There's a lack of, there's a lack of awareness that, we, that, that individuals need to uh, address there, that we need to address as a society to get more people employed. There's a growing industry need. Businesses are, are doing the their cost benefit analyses, and they're seeing that we need to invest into, uh, into uh, cybersecurity professionals, IoT professionals, and then ultimately there's an expanding marketplace. And so these are all things that are, that are impacting us. And just to put it in perspective, is that just in the US alone, there, was a, there's been a, there is about 1 million cybersecurity professionals employed. And I want to put that into perspective. There's also about a, a million uh, accountants in, in the US as well. So for every, I'm sure we all know an accountant in our lives. It's so for every accountant, there's, there's got to be a cybersecurity professional. If we also think about it all along the lines of law enforcement, there's about a million law enforcement professionals in the U.S. as well. These are that's where cybersecurity needs to come uh, ultimately uh, become. In fact, you can almost double it in terms of what our future needs from us in the future. So if you're talking about a million people, we need two million people almost basically about 1.8 million people to, to uh, operate effectively. And we're short that. And I know as higher education professionals, we've also looked at, okay, how do we actually help with the nursing shortage or the teacher shortage? And I remember folks back in 2000 were, were scrambling around to, to say, okay, we actually need to develop more R in the BSN programs. Now, here we are today, um, you know, and I'm sorry, uh, and now we're in today and we, we had a pandemic, we need more nursing professionals again. Now we're also at the fact where teachers are starting to retire at a higher rate. We tried to, you know, we're looking at how do we solve that problem in the future as well. The same thing needs to happen, but probably with a little bit more urgency in the cybersecurity profession. But what's the role of higher education? We're just at the, really at the beginning point of this here, if we need to kind of almost double our workforce. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of ways to do this. And we as higher education professionals, you know, we have undergraduate programs. These programs are growing at a fast rate right now. When I looked at NCS data, and I'm sure our friends at Lightcast also have seen this here, is that this degree is being added uh, at a higher rate than other degrees are. Graduate programs are also being added in terms of, you know, the whole cyber and technology areas, but also around computer science and things that are directly related to mechatronics as well as other industries or other professions as well. There's a lot of jobs that are starting to come up in policy. Uh, there's a lot of jobs that are coming up, you know, in terms of repairs and, and sensors and whatever. Uh, where do those fit in? Do they fit in the non-credit side or do they fit in the undergraduate side? The non-credit side, that's an area where our, obviously our friends at Thrive DX are, are playing a, a big role in, but they're also playing a big role with, and that's where, where WIT's job is in terms of being, uh, you know, heading up their, their university relationships here is they've been putting in a lot of places, uh, a lot of, you know, technology boot camps, cybersecurity boot camps, and data science and other things like that. So what's the role here within higher education, but how does that also translate into credit education? Because I'm, I'm of the belief that, you know, non-credit, if, if things are being taught in a non-credit format, but they're taught in a credit format, they should count if they're the same if it's the same topic or information here toward a credit credit uh, kind of degree there. We'll talk a little bit more with Wit about that as we go. But I'd even push this a little bit farther 
and say, what's in order for us to get to 1.8 million prof uh, professionals in the US in, uh, employed in cybersecurity, we actually need to step, step back further and we need to go to K through, K through 12. And, you know, K through 12 has got all sorts of opportunities in, in terms of career education, but they don't have enough in cybersecurity. People don't really start getting thinking about cybersecurity until they start getting into college. You know, but there's I think it actually can go much earlier, such as some of what some of what our high schools are already teaching. There's there's not a lot of cybersecurity training. There. Yes, there's a little bit of coding that's happening. Yes, there's a little bit of computer science. But how can you actually prepare an individual at a younger age in K through 12 to be a cybersecurity professional? So these are all things where where we have greater educational opportunities as we move to this new economy in the future. Next slide, please. So. Bruce and I started mapping out some of these things and how, how it might relate to, to what some of the things that Lightcast are doing. You know, they've got a lot of job industry classification codes that tie into IoT and cybersecurity, some of which, which we've mentioned, uh, uh, which were the obvious ones over to the right hand side. But I, I'm, I'm in the belief here that if you're learning something on the non credit side of things and it applies to a credit opportunity, maybe it should count for something. Maybe it should count for a credit or half a credit or some some hour, some currency that moves into it. And some of these, this is some of the um, a potential pathway that we may that that we kind of envision could happen here. Maybe you have a master's of science in engineering and IoT. Maybe there's an, a, a, an MS in IoT. Maybe there's an MS in in cybersecurity. Maybe there's the computer science end of things. We already have have these, but uh, but it, will this evolve into other areas or not? Should there be certificates that help bridge the gap between, between um, training uh, a profession and a degree? Our economy is moving so fast that I envision that there's going to be made greater non-credit opportunities, but also certificate opportunities. We're not going to need, we're not going to wait till 30 to 36 credits at a graduate degree level to put a lot of this in practice and be recognized for it. We might you know, have graduate certificates. Same thing with baccalaureate degrees. Maybe there are opportunities to put more of this in practice immediately with, with stackable credentials leading to a bachelor's degree. So all of these things are what we envision as an occupational pathway. So is, is this a big pipe dream or not? Or are others already putting it in place? Well, here's Florida International University. Florida International uh, University is a university that's close to my heart. I visited there uh, many times. Uh, wonderful people there. They're starting to put this into play. And so you can kind of see what they're offering. And this is a very stackable kind of credential, a BS in IoT, a, a certificate in cybersecurity management, an MS in IoT. And then they've got a lot of non-credit opportunities along the way. Witt also has mentioned that there's initiatives going on in Michigan. There's also initiatives going on in Western governors that this is starting to evolve. And I just look at supply and demand factors here in terms of higher, edu higher education is having a lot of challenges with the demographic cliff that initiatives like this and building out programs that align more quickly, uh, more, more closely to a fast moving economy and also a knowledge area such as IoT and cybersecurity are essential. So these are areas where, you know, if your university is struggling to, uh, to address the demographic cliff, why not invest into fast growing industries that are sustainable? These industries are going to be around for quite a while, and cybersecurity, as we know, is not going to go away. So I want to leave some time for questions, but let me let's advance the next slide, Bruce. So this is basically uh, programs that are offered, and programs are growing. But as I mentioned here, we still have a huge employment gap, as also what was shared, shared with us from our Lightcast folks here. But we've got a shortage of cybersecurity professionals here, and a degree is not going to solve all that need. We're going to have to work on other things. Such as K through 12, such as boot camp and other areas there. But ultimately, this is an area where this should be an area which could help offset losses that are going to happen just due to that demographic cliff and reap rewards that are going to happen in terms of a new economy. So, with that said, let me start shifting to, to a quick QA and then we'll take some of the questions from the audience. But I want to direct this first question over to Wit regarding what I just basically said about non-credit to credit education. Can these things coexist with, can you actually take like a skill that you learned, you know, and you got certification or a badge on regarding 
uh, cybersecurity that it relates to IoT and apply it to a degree. Are you seeing any examples out there in the marketplace? Absolutely. We're seeing examples and we have uh, partner institutions that actually do this with prior learning assessment and they give prior learning credit that when they take one of our boot camps and they um, graduate from it uh, successfully, uh, these schools have looked through our curriculum, of course, they're our partner, they've told us places where they feel like it could be improved or they really like, and so we work with them on that. And once individuals are done with the program, the school has already decided that once uh, once the student has that or the learner has that certificate, then they're eligible for a certain amount of credits in a certain program at the university to go towards either a bachelor's degree or to go towards a master's degree. So that's taking someone who has gone into a non-credit program and it's a program based on uh, helping individuals have the skills-based knowledge to get a job and do well at that job. They complete it, and then they have the opportunity to go into that, uh, to apply and go into that college and have, because they have that certificate, a certain amount of credits that is already cre accredited to them, almost like a, a transfer credits that save that student money, the university still gets revenue from the student coming in because that student is getting these certain amount of hours and the student has a little bit of a head start and it gives more of a, um, for lack of a better term, a carrot to go into further learning and to work towards that degree. And it helps the student because they continue their education and continue to go in depth uh, with that. So we see that both in the undergrad and in the, the master's area. And it's something that uh, our partners who are not doing it have been have begun asking us about. And as we talk to new partners, it's something we're always mentioning. And there is a heavy, heavy desire to see this happen, um, to give these students this opportunity. So absolutely, it's a wonderful opportunity for universities and for the learners. So let me actually ask a follow-up question to that because are you sensing that there's a lot of politics that are pushing that back or or are institutions embracing that? Because there's always a lot of debate on campus about this is training, the, how this doesn't count toward a degree, which I disagree with, by the way. But are but are you seeing are you seeing um, cul the culture on campuses uh, accept this a little bit more, or is it just because it's technology and they're used to this? that they're accepting that transfer, even though they're not too sure whether or not, you know, they're getting a one for one in terms of, you know, hours into a credit there. What's your thought about that? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. And of course, you know, of course, colleges and universities are political structures. And um, I certainly understand that I've worked in a university uh, for quite a long time. And now, of course, work with Thrive DX, but I've seen both sides of it. Uh, I, I would say it depends. It depends on the universities. Many universities, because of the demographic cliff, which you've spoken about, which is a real thing, and because many individuals want to get the education that they need, the skills-based education, to go into a job and to begin earning, but they still may want to get that degree eventually. They just want to go ahead and get into the field. That's growing. Uh, people who are returning to school who hadn't gotten a degree before, who aren't necessarily in that 18 to 22, 23 year old, you know, traditional college range, uh, but want to transition into new areas. Um, that's growing. And a lot of depends on the region the institution is in. Um, how much do they want to drive enrollment? Uh, you know, some schools. Uh, they feel like they're okay where they are. They certainly want to get what they would consider the best of the best students, but other schools, they want to give a broad swath of individuals the opportunity to get credit and to work towards a degree. And to do that, they understand because they've looked at the curriculum, because we've partnered with them, because they agree with the curriculum, it's industry-based, skills, uh, you know, not fairly, I believe, have got has been a bad word sometimes in higher education. But listen, anytime you are learning something in a college classroom, in essence, you're learning a skill. You're learning how to write well. You're learning how to speak well. You're learning how to do a math skill well, whatever it is. Those are the same things that we're teaching in these professional programs, skills that allow you to do something well that will then allow you to go out into the world and serve your purpose in a profession, in a job. 
And so we are seeing many, many more institutions because of the uh, you know, financial pressure, but because they understand that learning is learning and it's moving someone towards, uh, towards their goal, uh, they're very open to this. And uh, again, it helps that they're able to understand the curriculum, they're able to speak into it a little bit, um, they're able to work with us on that. So there's a trust of that curriculum, knowing that it's industry-based and how we teach it, uh, and all those types of things, but very, very open. And I think it's going to continue to grow um, as Great. we go along. Great. Let me actually ask the last question here because it looks like we answered one of the uh, ones in the Q&A. Uh, let me actually ask uh, Gabby and Morgan to reflect a little bit more on one of their slides that they talked about. They talked about <laughs> the top industries <clears throat> being semiconductor, colleges, universities, top job, job titles being robotics and, and basically the engineering and the product engineer side of things. But are there related industries? And I'll just kind of prime the pump a little bit. I, and Bruce kind of said it made me think about it, the sensor industry because you know we're, we're looking at an industry that's kind of fairly white collar over here. But are there things that? And I look at it the job shortage shortages that happened as a result of the pandemic, and then the, the hiring situation that's happening in the U.S. because our, we're getting an aging society and whatever. But are there other industries that would not be necessarily considered? blue collar right off and I use I'm white collar right off and I use those terms I know those are not the most politically correct terms here and Bruce is Bruce will always correct me but are there other kind of jobs that and I think Beth kind of was leading toward it is are there jobs that are are you know typically somebody with without an education could get into with some certification or some kind of boot camp or badging or whatever that is not necessarily engineering or robotic based that that you might see in Gabby or Morgan? Yeah, I can um, take that over. Um, yeah, of course. The one thing with, um, you know, industries is that sometimes they can be, you know, uh, very broad when we're, you know, looking at that. But taking um, the lens of, you know, mechatronic engineer and then kind of taking away that um, that formal education requirement, um, we do see the industries change a bit, you know, with the uh, top industries being more in the, the real estate, uh, rental and leasing, um, and less away from the manufacturing. So we do see a little bit of a shift there. Also, um, another big industry that um, comes up without the education requirement is, you know, administrative and support and waste uh, management services as well. Um, but of course, um, if you're looking at it at, from the mechatronic engineer standpoint, you're going to see a lot of engineering jobs, um, but there are other uh, job titles out there um, and opportunities as well. And, and I'll just add on to Morgan's point there. You know, I, I think what we're really seeing too is um, these certificates um, that can be, you know, that either you're learning uh, as those stackable, you know, micro credentials, um, you know, whether it's that um, or it's through a boot camp um, that are really serving to hold quite a hefty weight um, in the um, demand supply of the labor market. Um, and I think it's really through kind of those and kind of that universal language of skills is what we're seeing um, that what plays so much of importance um, or it's the transferability of skill that we're seeing kind of across industry too, you know, not your traditional hey, you need a four-year degree for this in blank, um, but really looking at a holistic approach uh, to things too. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm just going to close off things with, you know, I just look back at, at where we were five years ago and 10 years ago, and I was having a, I was probably having a Blackberry moment back then, but yeah, and where we're going right now and how things, how quickly things have changed. And if we, even if we look at the last Olympics and food and the food kind of situation there and protecting and also during the pandemic about how do we actually make things more automated then then we're looking at job challenges and what where that's going and then we're looking at the war in ukraine in terms of what's happening with drones and also military and criminal justice and other professions that are transforming as a result of robotics and other things and then we look at communications and how littered our skies are with satellites and whatever this is only going to get exponentially more different as we move at five years ago from now we'll be looking at you know all these things a little differently and i just think that this is where a lot of our new product development new program development within higher education needs to start shifting here and then as a result we've got to get we've got to get more secure and that just to have a two almost almost two million cybersecurity professionals out there is going to be so important and all these mechatronics and sensor people and sensor repair 
customer service, all that, all that's going to change. And so I can just only encourage you in the audience in higher education to start thinking that way and thinking as these as these are kind of scary things, but it's also opportunities for us within higher education to to grow, to do things differently, to align our portfolios with this future market. So with that said, I want to thank uh, Wit from Thrive DX. I want to th thank Gabby and Morgan uh, from Lightcast. Uh, thank you very much. It's always great learning from you and looking forward to what the future looks like as a whole. Our contact information was just up there, but you can also reach out to us later on and, and we'll be sending out a uh, the copy of the, hand, uh, of the presentation and a link to the recording. So thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you.